All right, here we go. It's a little loud. I'm gonna turn that down. This is Stephen. He's a good friend of mine. One of my best friends, in fact. Um, I'm, I'd say one of the most open-minded people I know. Uh, I've seen sort of a transformation from sort of where I was at with atheism uh, or, or a, maybe agnosticism. In, indifference or maybe just the idea that I don't know about a creator, mm -hmm. things like that. And I think as, as Katie and I have been hanging out with you and your wife over the last uh, three years, four years, you guys really seem to be open-minded and not in the way that you, I'll just tolerate anything or I'm willing to listen but I'm not changing my position about things. And I think that's something I've really come to respect about you guys. And I've noticed you, rather than just taking people's word for it about religion, you started really digging into mm -hmm. it. And I don't know if that's common, but when people start reading the Bible, their perception, their, their perspective sort of changes about that. Mm -hmm. if, if you want to give, give like a, a brief intro about yourself, sure. go for it, and then I'll, I'll bring, the, bring the question back up. Sure. Yeah, so I was born in a, a very religious household, raised Mormon, um, born in Salt Lake City, raised there till I was seven, attended church weekly, and then when I was high school age, went to early, semin early morning seminary on a daily basis. Um, <clears throat> so Mormonism, Mormonism was all I knew up until the point um, around my first deployment. I decided to take it upon myself to actually learn for myself what uh, what Mormonism was was actually about. Um, read the Book of Mormon, and wasn't convinced by it. I then started looking for alternatives. Um, it just so happened that as I was researching this information, Audible Audible was suggesting books like God Is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens and um, uh, books by Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion and that, that's the course I took. I keep bumping this mic. Um, so I read those books, and I found that atheism, the argument being made by guys like Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris, was a much more compelling argument mm -hmm. than, than what Mormonism taught. And I won't go into what Mormonism teaches, um, but needless to say, I was more convinced by it. When I got home from my... Uh, yeah, it's a little loud, isn't it? When I got back from my deployment, uh, left the church, which was, it was a big deal, especially for, for my family, but I felt that it was more important to to stick to what I believe to be true than to be persuaded to stay for the sake of other people's comfort. Um, so this is around the time that you and I met, mm -hmm. and I think that we're on the same foot Philosophically speaking, when it came to, I, I would have considered myself more of a hardline atheist, right. more of an anti-theist that um, taken on that that what do those get the new atheism of these guys? Yeah, what what you had been reading, at right, the time, right, in that exploration of is Mormonism right? Is religion right? Can I make rational sense of this? Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, yeah, I I would characterize you that way, and I. As far as the amount that we knew, I think both of us had pretty, pretty firm positions, even though we're standing on sand. Yeah. <laughs> with with very little knowledge about religion, mm -hmm. this is something I've I've been sort of grappling with now is how to marry the left and right brain. So what I see coming from your Sam Harris's and Hitchens and the guys that you were reading is a very, it's a rational case, mm -hmm. very logical, very rational. But when we're we're talking about things like metaphysics or the, the origin of, of man, of, uh, of spirit, what gives us soul and things like that. We're talking about transcendent ideas. And to, to do a, a logical or a rational analysis of yourself, I don't think you can use measurement. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of think that that's what religion is. Yeah. Um, you, how... How so far have you been able to rec reconcile faith and reason? Because you strike me as a very rational person. Mm -hmm. And now having dug into more spiritual types of 
reading something in theirs resonating with you too. Mm-hmm. Tell, tell me about that relationship if you can. Okay, so I think if your worldview is one of atheism, that makes it difficult to rationalize things like evil, mm-hmm. subjective morality versus objective morality. And that's sort of the angle or the path I took when I was exploring other ideas is how can I rationally explain morality? Um, And I think, and we've talked about this at length, part of atheism seems to be a look towards authority in secular figures. So Mm -hmm. more progressive politics, you know, supporting Democrats over typical libertarians or conservatives. God with something I can see. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think part of that leaves you blind to a lot of what this reality is really, really about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just to go off on a a tangent real quick to to help explain a little bit better, it was that right after Donald Trump was elected or right around that time, you know, you were bringing these ideas to me of, you know, um, why he was... I don't know, I'll let you explain. I don't want to. I don't want to cross your words, but you introduced me to arguments as to why Donald Trump might be the the better choice between the two, which led me into its own little rabbit hole, if you will, of comparing and anal- analyzing the differences between the the moral choice, which seems to be favored by the left side of politics, and the more rational, logical side of the right hand. So. As I as I went down that path, it opened up a lot of a lot of doors, and opened my perspective to the reality of evil, and there, it's really convoluted. But anyways, at some point, I got to you know online conspiracy forums, 4chan, and 4chan itself. I mean, it'll wake you up if you go on those forums and you read around a little bit. A little, some of the stuff you learn, a lot of the stuff I learned, it really shook my my perception of reality things things that you've never been exposed to mm-hmm. arguments you've never been exposed to positions people who are expressing ideas that you feel but never articulated mm-hmm. and never heard articulated i know what you mean go ahead okay so um as i'm being exposed to these these new ideas and and like having my world shaken, there was a part, there was a time where I had to, I had to acknowledge evil. Mm -hmm. And I got, I got stuck on it for a long time. It's like, what is going on with this? You know, like I never considered the, the right side of politics or the left side of politics evil, but there, there emerged something from those forms that was indescribably evil. Mm -hmm. Um, and th- that shook me up quite a bit, and it realigned or readjusted my focus um, on the political aspect. But as far as the spiritual aspect, I mean, it, it should go without saying, if, if reality, if evil is part of this reality, where does it come from? What is it? How can I explain it? Um, and that, that opened, opened a whole new world of online conspiracy forums and, mm-hmm. you know. I've noticed... I think this is something doctors say about people with PTSD, and it, it's a transformative experience when people see not just evil, because we, you know, horror movies, mm-hmm. we know about terrifying criminal behavior and things like that. But once you see your own capacity for evil, whether that's through your own actions, whether it's through introspective thought or observation of others, you see, like, it, the moment you empathize with, say, uh, the Columbine kids. Mm-hmm. Well, what was going on in these kids' minds? Like, the, you, you, if you read the the things these guys wrote about their classmates and what they wanted to do and what their motivations for, were for it, entirely logical, entirely rational. They they weren't crazy. They were possessed by something. That mm-hmm. thing, m- maybe what you're describing, is evil. But I think we have a tendency to see behavior like that as other. That's, I'm, I'm not capable of something like that. Mm-hmm. And so we, we put a cordon around it in our minds and it just gets shoved off to the side. 
So, man, I, I can remember, this is in one of those forums, uh, a video clip comes up of a guy who is tied to a mattress. He has uh, tires around his legs. They've already doused this guy in gasoline and he's sunburned. He's obviously been beaten a bunch and he's, he's tied to this mattress with like wires, just scrap wires. And there are 30 or 40 military aged men behind them. They're somewhere in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these guys have their faces covered and I'm thinking, that's fuck, like these are, I'm, I'm contrasting this with Antifa. I'm, I'm so ideologically motivated. I'm ideologically possessed. I'm possessed with this idea that that makes me and the other separate. And our, our capacity for evil w became instantly clear when I, like they s set this guy on fire and he's mm -hmm. thrashing around in these, these things that had previously bound him. He's got this last burst of adrenaline and he's breaking these things loose, but he's done. He's toast. And you, you just think like, I think I think most people would look at that and say I could never do that. I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it. Even if even if being even if at gunpoint I wouldn't do it. But I think we're so safe and so secure and and have it, such comfortable lives that we don't understand our own capacity for evil. Mm -hmm. And when once you confront that idea that not only does evil exist but you're a source of it. It's just not been tapped yet. Mm. Or we, there's there's no limit to our capacity for evil. So that that I that idea of, of evil started to come up in your mind from online forums and things like that. But then looking for I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but looking for the sort like who has articulated this the best? Mm -hmm. Who has articulated this idea the best of the contrast between good and evil and how to recognize the two. Yeah, which would, at the time, Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. you know, this this Canadian professor breaks out on the scene and he seems to be the antidote for that, that hole that the new atheism has left. Mm -hmm. And I, I recall the first time he was on with Sam Harris on his podcast and the two of them got caught up speaking about what truth was. Yeah. You know, what is truth? And at the time... I could only see it from Sam Harris's side, which was, you know, as he said, a, a very rational position. Mm -hmm. It's truth is what it can be weighed, measured, observed, quantified. Yeah. If it doesn't meet those definitions, we can't consider it fact. We can't consider it truth. It's not even real. Sure. And then Jordan Peterson. And I'm not sure if I think he clarified a little bit better on the second time they spoke. But um, it seemed that his his position was that. There, there's something more to truth than just being able to quantify it, but is it a benefit? Is it a benefit all the time, no matter where, at any point in time or location? Is it a benefit for humanity? And if so, that's what we should c consider true, because that's a pursuit worth pursuing. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the examples that they used was Sam Harris brought it up, you know, smallpox. Like the biological process of synthesizing and weaponizing smallpox is a fact. It's truth. We can do it. We can repeat it. Um, and it can be used against people harmfully. Mm -hmm. So should we say that that's not true because there are negative ram ramifications for doing such a thing? It seemed logical and, you know, it still does. Okay, th those things are true. We can, we can do this process over and over. Yeah. But Jordan Peterson on the other on the other hand was well, no it's not true it's not true not that we can't do it but that what are the effects of it going to be mm -hmm. um, I think the the archery terms he uses sort of clarify that in in a meme maybe so sin is just missing the mark mm -hmm. so you're you you have an aim you've you've articulated a goal or a virtue or something out there if I deviate from my trajectory toward that aim, I'm sinning. Mm -hmm. I've, I've sinned against the bullseye or the target. And the same thing, I, I can't recall the word you used now, but true, uh, if a, a, a weapon shoots true, a blade is true. Mm -hmm. There are probably better ways to articulate that, but 
it's it's not as simple as is the thing I'm saying a fact or non-factual but this thing can be repeated across time the the phrase he uses the sum of all gains mm -hmm. and it's going to be continually true always and forever and it produces an outcome that's desirable and I think he the way he he states this is uh, the thing that gives you meaning the what gives you a sense of purpose what what when you're doing it and you're engaged in it and whether it's difficult or not it feels like you're doing something and it feels like the end goal is just and right and true can't I also put myself in the position of someone who is trying to flip a car over I've got my mask my mask on I think I'm opposing fascism I hate the president I'm I'm motivated by this thing and it, it maybe it feels like a flow state if mm -hmm. you've ever experienced the flow state I'm I'm a part of something this is meaningful mm -hmm. I that's that's where I have uh, unless I'm articulating his position incorrectly I think that's where I disagree with that definition of truth because it's it it can be true in that way, but but false at the same time. The the repetitive nature, like you said, does mm -hmm. it does it work all the time through time? Yeah. So there's uh, Stefan Molyneux's Universal Preferable Behaviors. Mm -hmm. So maybe a way that we can look at this is: is it true all the time? And if it is true all the time, is it always beneficial mm -hmm. right so the way Stefan Molyneux would say you know if stealing is wrong some of the time or if it's wrong let me let me think of how to phrase this mm -hmm. stealing has to be wrong all of the time because if it's not wrong all of the time and everybody starts stealing from each other society breaks down and and you can't steal mm -hmm. if I want to be stolen from you can't steal from me right if I want you to take this notebook and you take it it's not theft so the the word itself loses its meaning if everyone wants to be stolen from or everyone mm -hmm. wants to be assaulted. So apply that back to the, the smallpox analogy. Like, yeah, we can do this thing. We can do it. But if everybody is doing it all of the time, if it becomes right at some point to weaponize smallpox and use it, how long before society breaks down until there's weapons of these of mass destruction released? So that's, in, in your estimation, that's the difference between truth and falsehood. Can you do it all of the time with it being right and not damaging? Mm -hmm. I think it can be applied to abortion. Abortion is a, a really good example. Is it, would it be beneficial if more people had abortions? Or maybe, maybe, maybe I can think of an instance where it would be, mm -hmm. but as a general rule, no. Okay. Lying. Same. Yeah. So, I mean, that was the premise of the universal prefer preferable behavior is it has to be right all of the time. Yeah. If there's instances where it's not right, then it becomes subjective. So are truth and virtue the same thing? I think they're really closely related. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're going to equate the two, you have to at least toy with the idea of objective morality. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're going to go there, there's a whole bunch of things that you have to admit or concede before you get to that point. That there are things that are not moral. And but why there not? There will be things that are not moral. If I'm if I'm exploring that area, there are things that are missing the mark. Mm -hmm. There they are. If there is virtue, there are things that are not virtuous mm -hmm. because otherwise everything is in that category of virtue. So I have to accept that not all interpretations are equally valid. Mm -hmm. Not all expressions are equally beautiful. And this, I think, opens up a whole other conversation worth having. Is why. Why are there things objectively immoral versus objectively moral? If, if we are the result of cosmological evolution, mm -hmm. if the atoms that comprise your body were just put together in the furnace of a sun and spat out, and that, that is the process, or Darwinian evolution, and it's just happenstance, ch time plus chance plus biology why are there rules why are there rules i think the same can be applied to pantheistic monism and you and i have touched on this before but so on one side you have everything is natural processes mm -hmm. on the other side you have everything is divine everything is 
part of an emanation coming from a single source, the single mind, the collective conscience, is emanating out. I have a hard time figuring out why one of them is subjective in, in terms of morality and the other is not. Saying all, all is chemicals, all is biology, all is natural processes versus all is divine, all is an emanation, all is one. Mm -hmm. Have you have you considered that? No, and I and I may need you to not not articulate it better, but maybe in a different way because I, I I think you're going past me. I, I understand. I think I understand the two categories you've identified. One is material, say, so that would mean the mind is an effect of matter, mm -hmm. and the other one is that mind is all there is. Uh, it's is that that's the word. Logos, correct, or or is that a third category now, where I have a, a creator and and the word brings forth both spirit and matter. So I probably just confused the idea. But <laughs> I, I think I understand those two main categories. Mm -hmm. I have the the spiritual, the ethereal. Yeah, everything is vapor, mm -hmm. and then I have the tangible, measurable, objective world. Precisely. So, in my mind. The two necessitate subjectivity. It doesn't, doesn't matter on which end you come from. If everything is the result of the source, the collective conscience, you know, everything is emanating from this, this mind, and the other is natural processes, I, I, I believe that objective morality can't exist in either of those worldviews. If... If I am the sum total of my constituent parts in the material world, yeah, I would think that my my sense of right and wrong, or any any moral code that I come up with, is the is determined mm -hmm. sort of. If there are universal speed limits set by this mind thing that I'm a part of, I'm again I'm I'm animated with consciousness by this mind which must also have a, a set of virtues mm -hmm. or a, a, a moral code of its own making that's subjective as well. You may be right. So there has to be uh, something that is outside of that to give you an, an objective mm -hmm. moral standard. And I, I, Molyneux is he's scratching into that. But you, you may be right that I, like, I'm, I'm going to keep clawing for this secular morality, mm -hmm. this system of, of laws that will work now and forevermore. But with, without those things coming from a, an independent arbiter, something that, that is outside of what makes these two things subjective, it, from the subjective, I can't arrive at the objective. Exactly. So I... My brain hurts. With that, you, I feel you have to introduce a third piece, a third component. Mm -hmm. Christians would call that the lawgiver. Any monotheistic religion would call that the lawgiver. What has instilled this natural order in this natural world that we occupy? Mm -hmm. So one of my my problems with pantheism that I can't I can't get over is if this is all an emanation of a singular mind, mm -hmm. and for anyone listening who doesn't understand this, I apologize. <laughs> or anyone who does better than us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, yep. So, and this is, um, we've touched on this many times before, duality, yeah. right? If everything is an emanation, and this goes from both sides too, mm -hmm. naturalistic processes versus divine processes dualism everything it has its own opposite good evil light dark hard soft all of these exist on poles and that there is opposition in all things mm -hmm. if there's opposition in all things how can we say which one is right and which one is wrong i don't think it <clears throat> i think you're right I, I don't think you can mm -hmm. if if bad is just a a gradient on its way to good. If I'm just looking at a spectrum from the most evil thing to the most good thing. Bad and bad is just 
a little less good, mm -hmm. I don't think you can. So I've used this analogy with you before. If, if good and evil are on a pole, mm -hmm. and those poles extend out in infinite length in either direction, mm -hmm. how far can you shift our, our frame of reference, where we're currently at, how far can we shift it to the good? Should be indefinitely. How far to the good can we make it? How how much pain and suffering can we remove from the world? How much lying can we? How how far can we reduce lying? Um, how far can we improve altruism? Versus going the other direction towards the bad, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. How far can we go that way? I think not much further than where we're currently at. If we increase the amount of deception, if we increase the amount of thievery, fraud, um, society breaks down, culture breaks down, the family unit breaks down. Right. So I don't think that they exist independently. I think that there, there's one that exists independently and true, and the other is a way to get to it. <laughs> a way to get to it through bad means. I guess what I don't know how else to phrase it. So take for example something that's commonly associated with wickedness or badness, pleasure. Pleasure if you isolate it all by itself is a good thing. Of course. Yeah. Like a, a hammer. Right. And there there's better and worse ways to attain pleasure. Mm -hmm. You know. I don't have to go into detail as to, you know, what those I ways would be. Kill. Sure. I'll, I'll kill someone that gives me pleasure or I can have some cake mm -hmm. money money is another thing that's commonly associated with wickedness money by itself if you isolate it is a good thing it gives you freedom it gives you power we're, we're imparting meaning to these things mm -hmm. but on their own good things to have so arriving at good things can be done through good ways or bad ways but there is no bad thing i believe that exists by itself independently that could be arrived at through either good or bad a thing that exists independently of anything else that is in and of itself bad sure or, or raw evil I, I think the last time we spoke I, I tried to think of an example of, of something like that and I can't mm -hmm. I can't and that, that's uh, Lewis's argument correct? yeah 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 so I only the good exists mm -hmm. and it's so is that the gift that that humans have been given or that we evolved somehow uh, is to ascribe meaning meaning to things through our actions because we, we, we wouldn't say that a tiger killing its prey is bad is wrong mm -hmm. in some way because it does it for survival and we can't teach a tiger to be a vegetarian but we can kill either one and and the the action itself if i'm killing to eat i may gain pleasure from that but i, I it's something that i have to do mm -hmm. if i'm killing for just pleasure just for sport uh or if i don't, I don't know if, i don't know if i'm saying this well but i think i understand what you're saying we 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 are uniquely capable in that way to take something a thing which in and of itself is good this mouse is good notebooks good neither are bad or, or maybe they're neutral mm -hmm. but they're closer to the good than what we think of it as yeah evil. well if you think of existence as good mm -hmm. yeah i mean everything that exists is good and it can be used for good or bad somebody said that in a pretty popular book what's that uh, the bible oh the bible yeah <laughs> he, he he and it was good mm -hmm. everything Everything that comes from that God, Creator, uh, Logos, the mind, what, what, whatever you want to call that thing, everything in it is good mm -hmm. in our view. And we can take those things and make them bad. So I'm always trying to get at something practical here, and it's it's... It's a thing, it's my thing that I'm stuck on, is I want to take these metaphysical concepts, I want to take these uh, intellectual things and make them practical. Religion does a pretty good job of doing that. Mm -hmm. 
um, giving you characters in stories that show you what happens when you do certain things, uh, showing moral lessons, and, and the, the morality is consistent through these stories. And, and it, I would even say that from one religion to the next, the, the moral code is roughly the same, but then there are prescriptions for action and, and living and things like that that are, are wildly different. Mm -hmm. Does it, it, it seems to me that it has to be an individual pursuit to, to slide that thing to the right, because if I try and force people to be good, my action, regardless of my aim, the, I, I see the action as, as wrong. Mm -hmm. that, that tyranny that would be required to make people ve veer toward the good. It's almost as if, like, all I can do is show you. Like, I can show you the good. I can be a demonstration of the good, and hopefully people follow that. But do, do you see another path to get individuals? Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're, we're the source of evil, inarguably. Yeah. Unless, you think, unless you think, and you may, that the devil is possessed, like the devil is a character and is possessing me when I uh, run a red light or I get the wrong change and I keep it. Mm -hmm. and, or I, I do something that's, just, that's missing the mark. Am I being possessed by something or am I consciously creating evil? Yeah. So I think that there's things that exist that we can't see other dimensions that may occupy the same space as us mm -hmm. you know there's there's we, we can only see so much on the electro yeah on the electromagnetic spectrum we could see almost nothing 0. 0.001 whatever same with here you know we only so high is our threshold for perceiving hertz and only so low mm -hmm. that that applies to every one of our senses you know uh, suppose that there's something that exists here with us in the same space that we just we can't perceive it's it's outside the threshold or low and high limit sure and you know there are people like alex jones who says that you know it's the lower vibrations the vibrations so low that are pulling at us david i calls them the archons these things that exist in the same spirit sphere just, as us just to draw in yeah and they feed off negative i'm sorry sorry feed off negative emotion you know, fear, hatred, these things. I can't discredit that. I can't discount it. And it might be a useful way of describing why people do things inexplicably when it seems to be a poor choice. Mm -hmm. you know, stealing is, is a good example. You know, it's, yeah, it benefits you in the short term, but you know, and everybody knows that that thing is wrong. If, if you didn't know that, there would be no need to be sneaky about it. Mm -hmm. You know, the sneak is the you know that that is the demonstration of it being wrong anyways so if you see the movie cloud atlas mm -hmm. you know there's tom hanks character he's always being plagued by this little creepy minion dude right. who's a uh, you know pressuring him to do make the wrong choice mm -hmm. and you know i don't think that that's far off the mark from what we may be experiencing now that could be it's a characterization or caricature of it but, you know, suppose something like that is happening. And that that is what the Bible is describing, that there is there is a battle going on exteriorly to us, on the external, the spiritual side of things, that there there is this battle going on, this cosmic battle between good and evil. And internally, you're at war with yourself all the time. Um, and applying good lessons like the the golden rule, are ways to to help you live a principled life towards making those decisions mm -hmm. um, and you know lots of different religions have a variation of the golden rule but what i think we come back to once again is why is the golden rule the right rule why is it not might is right so if if might is right and it very well could be you know if you're looking at it through a utilitarian or objectivism doing what is best for you at all times you know regardless if it's immoral or not might be the best thing to do so I, I don't fully understand this idea 
but I'll, I'll try and push back on that a little bit. Um, if my objective is purely self-interested mm -hmm. and I'm doing everything for my own ends, over the long term, and you, you may have stated this explicitly, over the long term, my actions, if they are not good and true and right, I'm going to lose, I'm eventually subject to the social consequences of that. So in the here and now, even if I benefit from stealing that piece of cake over the long term, there are, there are actual tangible uh, punishments for that, social ostracism, for example. And there are other people that I've been having conversations with about the same thing that are talking about this, basically the spiritual consequences of that. Mm -hmm. As you said, I, I recognize I'm sneaking. I'm sneaking to do this thing. So I know it's not right. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe I even compartmentalize it in my mind and, and put, push it out of my mind. I know I did this thing. I know it was wrong. Fuck it. The... I lost my train of thought. I lost my train of thought. Fear. We, we know it's bad. We know we're missing the mark. We do it anyway. If I'm talking about objectivism, objectivism doesn't support the idea that you should do whatever is in your own self-interest at the, regardless of the consequences. Mm -hmm. The consequences have to be considered. In, in that framework in objectivism because otherwise my, my long term objective is being sacrificed for the short term objective okay I understand so I'm sure that there are instances where even your long term goals your objectives could gain substantially by you doing something that you feel is immoral mm -hmm. if there's something beyond this if there is a moral lawgiver that will hold you to account for the things that you have done, then even that long-term goal in this, in this world, which we occupy, is still going to be held to account. You know, you're going to be, going to be judged, I suppose, for, for the things that you've done. And that, I'm sorry, I got some th phlegm in my throat. Um, so making the right choice always has to be and we've talked about this before the the thing to keep us from making the wrong choice has to be severe enough enough for us to not make that choice of course i, so, can, I can steal a forty thousand dollar car and chop it and get 20 grand out of it mm -hmm. is the jail sentence worse than 20 grand or i'm sorry man i fucked that <laughs> the the punishment for the crime has to be more severe than the the consequence, mm -hmm. the social consequence, or, or, or whatever. I think I think I'm articulating that poorly again. I, I just said this thing out loud a couple of weeks ago. And now I, I'm blanking on it. I know exactly what you mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, I think we're we're getting off topic a bit. But to bring it back to the the Christian perspective mm -hmm. on it, is the love of sin, which happens in all of us. You know, there's. In, in that book I gave you, The Confessions by St. Augustine, he, he goes into this, he's, he's describing this moment in his teenage years where he stole a pear. Him and his friends are walking down the streets of Greece, and they see a pear tree, and they go and they take all the pears off of this tree. And he says in his, in his confession, he said, I had better fruit than that at home. Like, n there was really nothing appealing about any of these, these fruit. We didn't even eat them. We took them because we thought it was funny, and then we ended up throwing them to pigs, and then I went home and I ate the fruit that was there because mm -hmm. it looked more appealing. So he questions himself. He, why, do, why did I do that? Mm -hmm. Why do all of us do that? And there's something, there could be that, that social pressure, you know, when, when you're with your friends to, to do something that's maybe not wise or, you know, not not right mm -hmm. for um, Can we do it of our own accord though mm -hmm. without without social pressure and if we do why are we doing it and so what i see as <clears throat> what the bible and i guess christian doctrine does really well is 
it, 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 it seems to explain those things pretty clearly. It, or at least it offers an explanation for those things. And it, it, it's the, it's the, maybe the most detailed depiction of that good and evil idea. Mm-hmm. What I see Christianity as lacking is the, um, and maybe this, I'm just missing it in that, the, the final judgment, that accountability is what are the spiritual consequences for this if I'm if I'm not caught stealing that pair mm-hmm. you know it's it's riding on Augustine's conscience long enough for him to write it in his confessions as he's sliding into the grave mm-hmm. what what do you think about that yeah are are we held accountable do we have a spirit that's being held accountable is that what's being described by that judgment here's here's the record mm-hmm. of you this is the understanding that I've arrived at. So we are created perfect. Adam and Eve in the garden lived in perfect accordance with what God wanted until they were tempted, told that by partaking of this fruit that they themselves could become the standard by which to, to judge. They decided for themselves that you know we're going to start, start deciding what is right and what is wrong. That, that is the fall. Mm-hmm. The fall is believing that you yourself can become the arbiter of what is right and what is wrong. And from then on, that moral law that we all feel, that we're all subject to, we can then start violating it. And, and I, can, I can reframe it. Mm-hmm. Like you said, if, I'm, if I have the material world in this basket and the ethereal world in this basket, both of which are subjective, with me as the, the viewfinder mm-hmm. for that subjectivity, and I can slide that scale wherever I want. And every deviation to the right or to the left of what that objective standard has been mm-hmm. is sin. So every time you decide for yourself that, you know, it's just it's just 40 cents sitting on the counter, I'm going to take that. Mm-hmm. Or it's, it's just a white lie, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell it. Every time that that is done, you're deviating from that natural law. Mm-hmm. That is sin. That's falling short. That's missing the mark. Whatever is behind this creation, if we can go so far as to to recognize a creation or a creator, we have to attribute to it perfection. Mm-hmm. The perfection of the creator is is it abounds. It's it's everywhere. If what you're... else would make only good things? Mm-hmm. Exactly. So if if the, the most fundamental things, existence itself, if that's good and it was created, the creator is above it and, and, you know, in some, some regard, which I don't fully understand yet. But right. So the nature of sin is rebellion against that perfect order which was established and during the creation. The revolutionary spirit. Right, which E. Michael Jones talks about mm-hmm. all the time, that rejection of Logos. And logos, I think it's it's more commonly used to describe aesthetics. You know, the, this thing is beautiful. This this song is beautiful. It's it's got it's got something written into it. Whether it's you know the phi ratio or, or the Fibonacci sequence. Symphonic. Sure. If those things are in it, then we say that that's logos. But I think that logos describes so much more than that. Yeah. Yeah. I I agree. Mm-hmm. It's moral law it's it's the the bonding of male and female it's mathematics it's everything that that came from that you know when the word was spoken everything everything that we see consciousness experience to the most fundamental thing is all logos maybe we just don't understand it because it's hard for us to figure out the, the complexity and the beauty of what is, you know, making this thing a reality. Yeah, I'm looking through my 5D filter mm-hmm. at it. And so I can see, oh, wow, there's a mathematical ratio that arises out of, out of these things that predicts action to some, some degree. There's a, a chord progression that these frequencies combine to form perfection. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that sequence that I can see in someone's face are those independent, which it, it doesn't make sense really that they are, just independent phenomena. 
whatever the source of those things is, is, is the code. Mm-hmm. It's, the, it's the cheat code for everything. And I'm seeing this much of it through a toilet paper tube that is my, all of the, all of the senses that I have, with, with, with the exception of, I guess, what, what people are describing when they talk about spirit or intuition. Mm-hmm. This is, intuition isn't a sense. We have five senses plus this other thing that is like my moral code, my recognition of someone's uh, facial features that lets me know they're angry, my, a vibe I get when I walk into a room. But I'm feeling those things in the same way that I'm experiencing sight and smell and taste. Mm-hmm. I'm tuned into that. So whatever I'm a product of something that is above the, the source from which all of these good things come, mm-hmm. I'm a product of that, and I'm tuned in to receive the ideal frequency. The reason I hear that chord, boom, it, it rings true. And what you said about morality, that, that sort of clicked, truth, fact, uh, the, the absence of error. If I strike a tuning fork, it rings true. Mm-hmm. Morality has to do that. And if it doesn't, it's not true. Yeah, so take it back up to that that point Mm -hmm. from which everything else comes everything good now can we start attributing characteristics personality to that thing Mm -hmm. we we have to we have to otherwise how how are we going to talk about it it's we're using mouth sounds Mm -hmm. to describe something that created the thing that makes the mouth sounds and allows us to interpret it Mm -hmm. if if we're taking this thing up so now we're talking about a personal god a personal creator i understand what you mean by that now. Mm-hmm. so what the bible the, the story from the bible from beginning to end is describing that thing mm-hmm. that thing's communication with us if it's personal is it personable can we speak to it can it speak to us is it interested in our affairs the bible would say yes it is like extremely interested so much so that it has interfered more than once in the going ons of this reality. And so, and somehow you you are your own tuning for it, mm-hmm. for that truth. You can feel it, and then there there have been cultures and societies that have been more or less in tune with it. And one of them in particular was the Jews in the Middle East. Before they were the Jews, it was the Israelites, and how they were selected is told in the first book of the bible genesis you know it talks about creation goes on to talk about the flood noah and then abraham abraham was this this figure who was selected i'm I'm choosing you to bring about this person that the rest of this book is going to talk about Mm -hmm. he's going to come from your line for the rest of the old testament It's about this struggle for this group, this tribe, to keep themselves separate and isolated from the rest of the people, from getting in there and corrupting the blood. Not not their blood, but their understanding, their communication with this creator. Because they're surrounded by different cultures like the Phoenicians and the Canaanites and the Nivites and the Hivites, all, all these other peoples, all these other groups who have different conceptions of what God is and what God wants. Mm -hmm. But somehow, they're all very similar in what they do to honor those gods. Child sacrifice, cannibalism, you know, these things. We talk about the cult of Baal. Mm -hmm. This cult of Baal, it it engulfs all of these other groups, with the exception of the Israelites, who, throughout the Old Testament, has this this practice, whatever it is, this darkness infesting their group. It comes in, it gets pushed out. It comes in, it gets pushed out. And at certain points, it gets so bad that God destroys the civilization. Babylon is sent in and they conquer Israel and they're sent off, they're exiled to Babylon. When God feels that they've established themselves enough to return sends them back to Israel they rediscover the law and they continue cherishing holding on to this this thing that God has given them the law you know the law to preserve it the prophecies of this person who's going to be coming to to save them 
is held on to for another 400 years after the last book of the Old Testament. And they're, they're waiting for him. They're waiting for the son of man to come who's going to be their king, who they perceive it as rule over their enemies and establish themselves a kingdom that's never going to be destroyed. And they're going to put everybody else under their foot. In comes Jesus Christ. A humble servant, born in a manger. He's saying, I am this person. I am the word. I came here. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. He's describing himself as this person who's come. Nobody really understands what he means, and I think John articulates it perfectly. In the beginning was the word. The word was God, and the word was with God. He took on flesh, came into the world. So what they're describing is that that thing at the top, which is emanating out, sending out all of this, the creator, mm-hmm. has himself or itself, however you want to phrase it, has made himself a man to come into our reality, to show us how to be. Mm-hmm. To he's, he's the same type of receiver for that Logos thing that we're seeing everywhere, we're hearing everywhere, all mm-hmm. of that stuff. And he's going to also demonstrate that, look, now I'm in flesh. You, There's no reason you can't ignore that Cloud Atlas ego monster. Mm-hmm. Watch. Just watch. Yeah. And then what do they do? <laughs> nail him to a tree so but that the death of christ is also prophesied about isaiah 53 talks about this the suffering servant this person who's going to come who god yahweh is going to take pleasure in letting die because by doing so he's going to take upon himself the sin and that when he is judged at because he died a spotless life no lived a spotless life and died perfectly that his lack of sin at the judgment is going to be extended to anybody and everybody who would believe in him because it's a perfect sacrifice Mm -hmm. and so that that sort of takes all that cult of ball shit you're giving me these imperfect human sacrifices you're giving me animal sacrifices you're giving me all the shit that like a sacrifice I probably misunderstand this idea, but uh, Cain and Abel's respective sacrifices. One was good, one was insufficient. Mm-hmm. It, it was inadequate because this this one's closer to the logos. This is this is a properly oriented sacrifice. There there are there are levels to sacrifice. Mm-hmm. This one's perfect. This is perfect without sin. The the full expression of logos in a form that is in your 5D reality so that you kids can understand this. Mm -hmm. Watch what happens to this guy. What you said a second ago, like being the chosen people and being of the line of Abraham, this by today's conception is the most racist thing I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. To say that you, because you are from a, a particular bloodline, that you're the only person who can communicate with God, that God is going to, the, the son of God, the, in flesh is going to come from your blood mm-hmm. and th- that instantly makes a distinction between you and your line and and everyone else because we are the, we're the closest thing to to Christ mm-hmm. so look at look at what happened right around the time of the crucifixion Christ died his movement that he had begun in this this small region in the Mediterranean looked like it was it was doomed around the same time there were other messianic figures who who came cropped up and and they died and those those movements died with them mm-hmm. jesus when he died what he started his teachings blew up right and it's it's not just in this the central isolated little area of judah that it blows up where they've had the, these traditions and these philosophies for at least a thousand years. They, they've carried on the Levitical law and any deviation from that law would cost you your life. And, you know, we, we know who we're talking about. We're talking about the Jews and the Jews and their tradition have, have been, you can't move them mm-hmm. very set in their ways. And, so not only does it make a huge impact with these people that have retained their identity, retained their culture, and have been the most significant people group 
in all of history. Mm -hmm. So as far back as we can remember, there's the Jews, and they've retained this tightly Mm -hmm. as far back as you want to go until this new philosophy is introduced, until this new person or this person comes along and says, that that thing that you've been communicating with, that I gotta run out for a second. Yeah. Goodbye, Tanner. So it's just me now, folks. This what he said about the expansion of Christianity. The, the thing that came to mind when he said that was that harmony idea again, uh, something ringing true. And that, that made my mind jump again to a story like Beauty and the Beast or uh, Harry Potter. These, these tremendously popular stories. There's a reason that these things sell millions upon millions of copies and you can get children to read four or five hundred page books about these characters that are just made up, these wizards and witches and things. And it's because they get they get the notes right, they get it exactly right and it rings true. So this thing if we're gonna compare this with other religions, which one spreads most effectively? Is it Christianity? It, is that the measure that we should use? Is which one spreads most effectively? Which one produces the greatest good? Which one rings the most true? And how would we compare those things? But, so, so I, I just thought of the question I have in response to, to what you've said there. <clears throat> you mentioned the, the rapid expansion of Christianity. Uh, Christ comes and says these things. Uh, people seem to like these things it spreads like crazy does it spread like crazy because he's he's hitting he's hitting it exactly right and it resonates with people and and the example i used a moment ago was harry potter harry potter sells millions upon millions upon millions of copies and it's because they get the story exactly right so people they recognize yep that's the truth it's it's all fantasy Mm -hmm. but we recognize it this is a good this is a good story that's a good song this is a good painting this thing that's coming from Christ, people recognize, yep, that's that's it. Mm-hmm. That's the truth. If we're using that as the standard to measure a religion, we're, we're looking at, does it ring true? Does it produce the most good? Does it spread? How does Christianity stack up against the other leading religions, let's say Judaism and Islam? Because mm-hmm. if I look at Islam... They're spread, but if I look at the what it produces, I don't see that as good. But mm-hmm. I'm judging it from my material American position here. Right. So, shortly after Christ dies, first century, right? Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul, he begins his mission, and he's going up into Greece and to Rome, and he's debating these ideas with people who they themselves believe in a pantheon of gods Mm -hmm. as as far from monotheist as you can get he's he's going into these regions and he's bringing them this idea this started off as a hebrew notion of what god is and then it transformed through the teachings of christ into a new understanding of what god is a personal god who loves you who wants good things for you who has interfered in this reality in this creation Mm -hmm on your behalf for you it it explodes there so you know in greece where philosophy is birthed and plato and aristotle and all these you know i know that the time time range is a little bit different but these ideas have survived and they've thrived and they've propagated out of this place so you have two totally different cultures and societies and ideologies melding together because of this this new understanding of this personal creator god we've we've been talking about the same thing in two different ways Mm -hmm. and 
we we just realized the uh, the pantheists the greeks we've just realized that yours is a, a version 2.0 to this thing that we've been pointing mm-hmm. to with our dramatizations and, and and such the greeks bring their ideas and their philosophies and their ways of describing god the hebrews bring their ideas of god and their tradition together mm-hmm. and you have christianity yeah from that we, we know what happens from that. We have Western Europe. We have the, the fastest advancements of society and the most beautiful architecture and the most beautiful art and the most, the most amazing civilization happens right after this. Mm-hmm. We introduce this idea and boom, yeah. something new just happened in the world. A big bang. <laughs> so how you compare that in contrast to other ideas like Islam well, Islam, for one, is not a philosophy that is spread through dialogue like mm-hmm. Christianity is. It's by the sword. By the sword. What are the fruits of it? We know what the fruits of Christianity is. It's modern society. The, the way we understand it here in the West, mm-hmm. the fruits of Islam in the Middle East, it's barbarism. They, they've been stuck in a place in a time and have not shifted forward with the rest of the world, which... If it works for them, fine. But if we're talking about ideas and merit, it seems easy to me to say that the merit goes to the one that can persuade you through dialogue rather than through the sword. So I, I would I would agree with that point specifically. Mm-hmm. When I'm when I put myself in a position where I'm judging the culture and the uh, the way of life in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq and saying that my my society is better than that one. I don't live in that society. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at it and, and saying, well, you don't have an iPhone. You don't have a couch. You don't have a car. You don't have shingles on your house. Mm-hmm. Is that the standard by which we should judge a society? Is how fast is your 4G? Of course not. So the, the point you made is valid and I agree with it about the the way we should be judging these things by their fruits. I, I don't know if if looking at it from materialism as opposed to the Christian perspective you're articulating, I, I don't want there to be any confusion. Mm-hmm. People, anyone who might listen to this to say that we're, we're conflating the Christian identity with this materialistic view. So take the Notre Dame cathedral for example when christianity was injected into the society and even ancient european society was totally barbaric you know you had small tribes the scathians or scathians um the britons the norwegians all, all these these people groups existing independently in much of the same way that the rest of the world existed no, without without too much variation like, yeah they, they may have been better at things they may have been better at, at traveling and um, storing food and may have had higher intelligence but that remained consistent for a very long time now we introduce this idea this christianity and then you get a cathedral and you get a cathedral that that takes decades decades and decades to build um i'm, I'm not sure the exact time span but it's I would bet hundreds of years. The people who started it are not the people who finished it. Right. And that takes vision. It takes it takes logos, tapping into something higher than you, above above you, to complete such a lofty goal. And to do it with such aesthetically pleasing beauty and incorporating those things that we've previously talked about, mm-hmm. the angles, the Fibonacci sequence, and tapping into something beyond mm-hmm. beyond you. That thing that we're tapping into, I think, intrigues me more than anything else I think about. Why, why do all these things resonate? Why, um, why, when people get free time, do they make things like megalithic structures? I, I, would, I, I would compare those two things. Um, a astronomically oriented Gobekli Tepe mm-hmm. monument with the cathedral. Obviously, one is way fucking better, but they're the same thing. Mm-hmm. They're the same thing. We're po- we're pointing at something that's beyond ourselves. 
I can't, I feel like there's not anything else worth talking about beside those things. I've, I've arrived at that myself. <laughs> and so, like, it's sort of making me, uh, pessimistic probably isn't the word, but I notice I work on the beach. Mm-hmm the things people are talking about and want to talk about and I get you know you need a little introductory small talk and stuff I I jump right past that and it freaks people out yeah and I don't know if it's that I'm like if I'm becoming a weirdo because I'm interested in these more cerebral intellectual things and I'm I'm like I feel like I'm discarding old clothing mm-hmm. <laughs> but that old clothing is <laughs> so I, I I'm really interested in the practical application of this. And I think we discussed this before. Like I have to just start reading these things, yeah. either the audio books or reading them. I'm going to start with that Augustine book. What, what would you recommend to someone who's, who is listening to this? If they want to start exploring these ideas, is it as simple as read the Bible and form your own opinion on it, or what? Like, what? What do you think practically people can do with this kind of information? Because it, it's it's so cerebral. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, how how is that going to put gas in my car? Yeah, it's it's difficult to say. I know everybody's ability to digest it and to know what to do with it and where to progress to is going to be different. When when I left Mormonism, I. I disregarded God, the idea of a creator, and Jesus Christ entirely. I thought it was based on silly notions and faulty history. And, you know, I, I watched that Zeitgeist documentary, mm-hmm. you know, and a big part of that documentary is, you know, well, Jesus Christ himself is just a retelling of this astro theology story that's as old as time itself. You know, he's no different than Horus or Dionysus or Mithra. It's all the same thing. So, that's not the true case, though. It's not. And if if you can get to a point where you can see the subtle differences between the stories, and in some instances, they're not subtle at all. They're, they're very different in the moral lesson it teaches, its application and description of logos. Not to mention, if, if this idea, this, this logos thing, I'll just mm-hmm. use that word to describe it, is the point from which all of these things emanate all of reality emanates mm-hmm. it should be no surprise that the Christ figure comes in 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 a pattern a recognizable pattern in something that is intuitively true and that these the story of Horus for example reflects the same archetype if all of these things are the product of the mind of God it should be no surprise that they mirror one another mm-hmm. but we're going to have as you said subtle or obvious differences depending on how we how I slide this scale to Mm -hmm. suit my own purposes sure so once you've you've understood them gone to a point where you can say okay well this is this is what this story is telling me there might be and this is a whole other thing that the heroes heroes tell the mono myth that exists throughout society does the story of Christ does it match that and if not, where, why doesn't it? And where is it missing the mark? And apply that to everything. You know, what, what's different? Try to find the differences between these things. And if if somebody's looking for a piece of advice, you know, I I picked up the Bible because I thought it would be interesting. Because I I had gotten to a point where I, I sort of understood the idea of a mind being behind reality mm-hmm. rather than natural processes and Big Bang cosmology. I picked it up because I thought it'd be interesting and I, I didn't make it far into the first book and I was just blown away. Ding, true, yeah. ding, true. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And I was familiar with all these stories, but I was reading it with a brand new set of lenses on mm-hmm. and it just, it, it shook me up, it shook me up in a big way. And at that time I felt like there was so much turbulence in my life because of these, these things I was discovering, mm-hmm. you know, the the massive the massive amounts of pedophilia that that exist in the upper echelons of our Warren, society famine and, and taxpayer funding our own incarceration yeah all, yeah 
shit's fucked up. And you, you, you drink this stuff through a fire hose and it, mm-hmm. it really, it shook me up. Just, I don't know what to make of this place. I don't know what I'm doing. There, there was a time where I was like, I might be dead. <laughs> it's like, what do you think? Can you think of what the pill was? The first pill? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was, the first thing was when J- um, Donald Trump released those JFK pe- papers. Mm-hmm. And I remember joking with you, like, Eddie Bravo is probably losing his shit right now looking at this. <laughs> and so I went through it and I read it and I, I wasn't really surprised by anything. But what really struck me was, you know, for 60 years, people believed that this thing happened this way. Mm-hmm. And the people who doubted it were pushed to the fringes, considered. Yeah, crazy. yeah. but th- this confirms that all of those people were right in questioning and from there it was just a snowball well what else is there what else is there yeah and if you go far enough i don't recommend it all yeah. the time if what's at, what's at the end of all of these mm-hmm. tunnels yeah. so you tumble down that rabbit hole long enough and i did for as long as far as i could go and like if if i could explain or describe my mental state it was on an e on an EKG when there's artifact, mm-hmm. just t- 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 no pattern, no rhythm. It's Random just electrical PA. Mm-hmm. And so at that point, I was I'm willing to try anything to make sense of this. Um, and reading the Bible was one of the last things I considered. You know, just because of my pride, and my arrogance, and the things that I had said as an atheist. Mm-hmm. You know, disparaging towards Christianity. It was one of the last things I looked at. Um, I did lots of lots of meditation, messed around with psychedelic drugs, and um, I, I wouldn't say I messed around with meditation. I, I practiced meditation. Mm-hmm. I I still do, but none none of it was giving me the results I wanted. Mm-hmm. And so I, I read the Bible, or read through a good portion of the Bible, went to the New Testament, read that, and I I got it understood understanding for the first time of what it was saying, and. I was like, I'll, I'll try this. I haven't tried any, you know, I've, I've tried so many other things without the results I've wanted. I'll try it. And this thing, that transformative experience, your your character arc, mm-hmm. kicked off basically by confronting evil. Yeah. Look, look at what there is. What's the antidote to that? Mm-hmm. And the, the best answer you found was in that book. Mm-hmm. Here, here, here's how, here's the, Here's exactly what I'm asking you for. Here's the practical application of this knowledge. Here is here is how I boil down metaphysics into some easy general rules for me to follow that are going to keep me in alignment with I'm, I'm moving right instead of left. Mm-hmm. So, gave it a shot. Mm-hmm. I, the first I, I was like, I'm, I'll say a prayer. Like it felt silly. It mm-hmm. felt kind of you know. There's there's a certain amount of humility that goes into it mm-hmm. um, that my personality type I'm not n- used to giving mm-hmm. so but I prayed and instant feedback instant feedback that I, I had never experienced through any of the other methods I had attempted mm-hmm. I, I didn't see anything I didn't hear anything it wasn't a manifestation something that I could perceive with my senses it's but outside 5D it was that artifact going into a normal sinus pattern mm-hmm. instantly. Yeah. It, and from that, that point on, it's, it's become the most interesting thing in my life. And I want, to, I want to read as much about it as I can, and I want to study it. And it's, it's become not an obsession, but a discovery of something that I know is good, honest, beautiful, and true. And... I'm going to take it as far as I can. I'm going to learn as much as I can about it. And I'm going to apply the lessons that are there contained in that, not not just that book, but the philosophy, the theology Mm -hmm. of Christianity. And I'm going to apply it as well as I can. And if I'm falling short in any area, I want to, the good thing about Christianity is it'll help you identify those things. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I guess that's been my journey and that's where I've landed. And it's, it's comforting, comforting in a way that I, I wasn't receiving 
through any other previous philosophy that I had ascribed to. So I think we hit the tripartite here. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we, we got into the metaphysics a little bit, and then now the tool that you can use to access that. How, how can I determine what's, what's right? I'm doing it based on this sixth sense, this intuition that's built into me that's beyond the 5D. And here's, here is a tool it may not be the tool, but for you, this is this one rings mm -hmm. true, and is allowing you to access that thing. You your your brain is scrambling trying to grab hold of. Right. Next time we do this, I'm going to try and poke some holes in that. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I do intend to read that Saint Augustine book, and I am going to read the Bible, and I want to know like how is this book justifying slavery mm -hmm. when it's it's the path to the the most common good and things like that. That's the first thing that pops in my head, but we'll do this again, man. Sounds good. All right, dude.